Well, good morning. So glad to be back with you guys. Uh, uh, we missed you, and I hope that the message of love uh, that we shared last week was just uh, t- touching the hearts and reminder of all we need is love in this place. And so, uh, once again, I want to welcome everyone, uh, both in person and streaming. I'm Pastor Matt, and uh, for all of you at home, know we miss you, and we uh, love you watching at home as well, and just encourage you to be uh, active and interactive during services, sharing uh, God's peace with one another and any prayer requests you have that we can pray over them. Uh, and so just want to share a few uh, things going on. So uh, this morning we're continuing our uh, series and really digging into uh, 1 Corinthians right now called Love Never Ends. And today we're looking at uh, what is it that we go- have to hold firmly to in these crazy times with so much still going on in the world um, what, is, what are the things of first importance that we as people of Christ cling to when everything else is going haywire? So that's what we're going to be focusing on, and, um, and it's just a powerful reminder of uh, where we look in hard times. And then next week, we're continuing by looking at what the first fruits of the resurrection are. And so we're going to be reminded of how Jesus rose first and how he's the foretaste of what's to come for all of us. So uh, we'll have a beautiful, uh, almost like an early Easter celebration over the next few weeks. So that's an awesome thing to be able to do. So that's uh, next week at 10 a.m. So you can join us uh, for a blended service as uh, today's our traditional service. And next week we're back to blended at 10 a.m. And uh, also wanted to share that at uh, the service next week, we're going to be inviting our uh, good friend from the uh, Des Moines Police Chaplain, Lou Cox, um, from the Des Moines uh, Police Chaplains Fund, as they were one of our triennial giving partners for last year, and we're catching up on those. And so um, he's going to be speaking a bit to us and just sharing um, how our support uh, impacts our community. And then uh, in early March, our plan is to have Lighthouse, who was our final uh, trying to give him partner to speak uh, a bit to what they're continuing to do. So I just wanted to uh, share. Uh, that's going to happen. So yeah, please come next week to, uh, to listen and hear from Chaplain Lou. And then also wanted to um, say one last time, this is sort of the last call. If you're uh, willing to help uh, in serving uh, the greater church, we have our Northwest District Convention that's coming up in Portland from June 9th through 11th. So if you're interested in serving, please let uh, me know sometime this week as uh, we have to get that representation uh, finalized. So uh, please let me know uh, if you're interested in doing that uh, for the dates that are up there in Portland. And then finally, just want to share, we have a really uh, great stewardship thought that's in the uh, bulletin on the back page. So you can take a look at that. Um, a reminder of how God's grace makes us what we are. Um, and we're going to hear that earlier, or later actually, rather, in service. And so that's what we, we cling to, is that by God's grace, we are what we are. And so we can celebrate that grace and love this morning. So let's uh, rise and stand to do that. And we worship this morning in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now let us sing out and celebrate the day of resurrection.
And yes, we do give him all power, honor, and glory into our Lord, we pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that through your death and resurrection, you have saved many lives. Through it, the penalty of sins has been paid, forgiven, forgiveness has been achieved. And we can rejoice that you are victorious over sin and death and have secured eternal life for us. Help us to remember and not forget these truths which are of first importance. Help us by your spirit to take our stand on your gospel by repenting, believing, and holding on to it firmly. Amen. Amen. There are times, though, when we don't hold on to it firmly, instead try to hold on to the things of the world. And in those moments, we sin, and so for that, we have to confess. O oh, our firm foundation, we are sorry for the times when we do not hold firmly on to your word, but trust in our own strength. For the times we warp words from your word to justify ourselves in our minds, for the times when we trust more in the things that we do for our salvation, instead of relying on your grace, which you freely pour out upon us. Please forgive us and please help us to hold Christ in the center of our lives, to cherish him as the most precious thing in our lives. We pray that through your spirit, you might help us never to forget that we come to you only through grace. So take a few moments of silence and give over to the Lord those places where you haven't had him in the center of your lives. Hold firmly, hold firmly to this good news. God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins from us. Rejoice that the triune God has forgiven you and opens a new future this day. Amen. Amen. You now may be seated as we have our scripture lessons for this morning. Our first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, although some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let's all rise for the gospel reading. Our gospel reading is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, and reads as follows. Frank, it's the Luke passage. What? It's the Luke passage. It's in Luke. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of generous that the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boats. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish. They had taken, and so were James, John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for men. So they pulled up their boats and on shore and life, everything, and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And as we see the haul of fish that Jesus helps bring in and calls people to be fisher of men, we have to know what we believe to tell those people. And so that's why we confess together. And with our traditional service, as we did last month, we're going to confess the Nicene Creed to do this. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You now may be seated as we continue to worship and we sing out about our Lord's amazing grace.
let's start with that amazing grace as our prayer. Lord, we thank you that you give us your amazing grace through all the toils, dangers, and snares, that you wrap us up, that your amazing grace never lets us go. And so, Lord, we ask that we could hold firmly to you and to your grace. In this time of the message, throughout our weeks, throughout every moment of our lives, may your grace and love be what we put forth. And Lord, may it just be a small snapshot of this in our message for this morning. Guide the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts to focus on you and your grace alone. And remove any temptation or distraction that would come up against us, that would try to help make us slip away from you. Let us hold firmly to you and your gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, as the uh, picture is going to change over, you're going to see a picture of me, and that's uh, me on top of the Space Needle from uh, when my brother visited uh, right before Thanksgiving. And I hadn't been up on the Space Needle since the remodel, and it's pretty amazing to see. Uh, if you remember back in the day, you used to walk out and it was all sort of fenced in, and now they uh, have replaced the fencing with these giant glass panels, and so it gives you a panoramic view, but the thing that's sort of scary is that there's really nothing behind that glass in case something were to happen. And so uh, this is a picture from when we first got out there. So you can sort of see that I'm not exactly 100% comfortable. You can see my posture's leaning forward as if I don't fully trust the glass backing to lean against it. And if you look closely at my hands, you can see they're ready. They're ready to hold firmly to the bench just in case something crazy were to happen. Thankfully, I'm here and my brother's here, so nothing crazy did happen. And my brother and I had a great time up there. I would suspect, though, I'm not the only one who would want to hold on to something firmly up there while sitting there. Am, am I the only one, or would someone else want to hold on firmly? Yeah, I think we would, right? Um, and the fact is, that's how we are in all areas of life, isn't it? We all want something we can hold on firmly to. We want stability. And people out there, they want the same things. They want stability. They want security. They want to know the thing that they're holding on to won't let them down. And as we continue our sermon series, Love Never Ends, we're going to look at what Paul encourages the people of Corinth to hold on firmly to. And what we see him call out is you need to hold on to the things of first importance. And as we see what he calls the things of first importance, this will inform us of what we're to hold on to in all circumstances. This then, as we know what we hold on to, can be a revelation and a hope we then can pass on to others, letting them know what they can hold on to in troubling times, things that won't turn out to be a bust. I say that because a lot of the things that so many of us have been holding on to have been uprooted. The things that we held on to for security have vanished or altered in big ways. Just think about that with something like our routines. Routine is something that we like to hold on to. But over the last two years, man, haven't those routines changed? Those things that we held on to are things that we still can't do the same as before the pandemic began. And I know this is an extremely tough thing for all of us, no matter where we're at with it. It doesn't just uh, go easy or fade away. To give a visual of what it's been like, I imagine this all as humanity as young kids who are going skiing for one of the first times. You might be saying, well, what do you mean by that? Well, kids usually aren't uh, able to man the ski lifts uh, when they ski right away, and so they start off by using tow ropes, right? The tow ropes uh, get them up the bunny hills or the small hills. And to get pulled up a tow rope, you have to hold on firmly to that rope. Because if you don't hold on, it'll yank out of your hands and you'll slide back down. And that's what's sort of going on right now. So many of the things that we thought were tow ropes that would pull us up the mountain of life have 
have not been working right now. And people are holding on and they see the tow rope not going anywhere and they're struggling, wondering, is this going to fail me and am I going to slide all the way back down the mountain of life? And the thing is, they don't want to go back down to the bottom. So in these moments, what do we hold on to that keeps us from sliding all the way back down in the rope that will never malfunction? Yes, God's word. And this is what Paul writes in that word from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5. For what I received, I passed on to you as, for, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, but in it stay there, but that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And not only did that happen, he goes on and says, and he appeared to Cephas and the twelve, and he goes on and lists many more. There's witnesses to that, and some are still with us, he says. This is what you hold on firmly to. Jesus' resurrection is the tow rope which God's chosen people hold on to for dear life as we ride up that sometimes snowy, steep, unpredictable mountain of our lives before God and before one another. Going on, Paul implies that somehow we let go of that resurrection. We're in danger of plummeting all the way back down. In fact, Paul's urgent appeal to the people of Corinth suggests that some of them have already let go of that tow rope. That is the gospel of Christ's resurrection. Some have forgotten that faith which God has called them to through grace and the power of the resurrection. And others are in danger of transplanting their houses, moving them off the solid rock and shifting them onto the shifting sands. And we see that happening all around us as well, don't we? Even within the church, we struggle with holding on to the wrong tow ropes of a fallen creation. Whether they're tow ropes of our material possessions, our wealth, like I mentioned earlier, our routines or our politics, whatever it might be, those tow ropes are ultimately going to let us down. Yet Paul refuses to give up on those wavering Corinthians, and through the generations of his living word, he refuses then to also not give up on us. He begs them, and he begs us, listen, listen to the gospel again. Jesus' resurrection, after all, isn't some myth or thing that he just made up. It's concrete, it's real, it's embedded in history. There's a gospel testimony to a particular time or place. You can ask these people, and they can witness, and you can see that it's a witness to life, death, and resurrection over sin and death. And this is what we are to hold firmly to as the core of our faith When the tow ropes of this world fail us, we remember. We don't remember an idyllic past with rose-colored glasses. No, not at all. We remember the good news. Remember the proclamation. Remember Jesus. We must go back to Jesus at all times, especially in the midst of strife and division. Go back and remember the story, the simple, straightforward story of the life and resurrect, death and resurrection of the living word made flesh. Because it's still at work inside you this day. Now, what do, what do I mean by this? Well, let's go back and reread verse 2. By this gospel you are saved, Paul writes. If you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. And Paul's saying, so it's all about the gospel. And this isn't something that you have just received and on which you stand, but it's also the narrative and person of Jesus Christ doing something in your life. You are saved. There's something happening to you. And it isn't just that you are saved, that it's a past thing. In the Greek, that word for being saved is a continual action. It's ongoing. 
You are being saved. You are being saved. And that's a critical reminder for us as we hold firmly onto him that all of us are still works in progress. We are all works in progress. And here's a word for those who don't think they're good enough, who don't think they measure up. You are still a work in progress as a child of God. God hasn't given up on you, so why should you give up on yourself? God is still at work. The, the molder, the sculptor is still molding you as clay. You're still a work in progress in the hands of the beloved. So why would you consider that you'll never get it right? Even in the crazy times of life right now, God is still with you. He's holding on to you firmly. You are still being saved by him no matter what is going on right now. Even when you feel like you're losing grip of the tow ropes of this world and when you feel like you're going to plummet and descend down, he will not lose his grip on you. He will hold on to you firmly and not only that, he will lift you up in grace and love. And as you experience him lifting you up in the hope of the resurrection, you can then share this story with others in your spheres of influence. You can share how Jesus has held on to you firmly through his death and resurrection, even in times where you've been going through valleys or dark, lulling times, he has held you and he can lift you up in those times. You can share how it's not an easy journey, how it's been rife with struggle, with wayward ways and hard times. You can share how you are still a work in progress. But that's exactly what makes the story of God's grace, of the grace of Jesus, even more impactful when people hear about it. That it's not for perfect people. It's not for almost perfect people who maybe have an A minus in life. It's for all of us. It's for all of them. Average, everyday people. It's even for people who we think are the worst of people. And this is something Paul could relate to, and he shares this as part of his testimony in this narrative. As we read in verses 9 through 10, For I, I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God, he's honest with his history. He's honest with him being the least, living in humility. And words that he points to is the only reason he is what he is. That's what's on the screen. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. This is what changes. This is what transforms. It's the grace of God. There was a time when he first heard. There was a moment on that road to Emmaus when God changed everything. And he didn't earn it. He didn't deserve it. He wouldn't have chosen in that moment to receive it himself. But there it is. There it was, and now there he is, firmly held by grace. So too are you. You are firmly held in the grace of God, like we've seen that amazing grace. When in doubt, go back and look at the story of how you have been claimed by grace, and then share that story of grace, love, and how you are held firmly, how by the grace of God you are what you are. And as we step back and look at the bigger picture of uh, what Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians about a love that never ends, we can see an amazing picture come together. Paul pleads with the people of Corinth to move past fighting and arguing about gifts and go back into a relationship. 
And not just any relationship. Go back to the relationship that first brought you here. When the Holy Spirit claimed you and now equips you. Hold firmly to the faith of Jesus Christ, who is who he says he is. And out of that fundamental relationship of the Holy Spirit fueling our lives and the power of the gospel of Christ informing our lives, out of that fundamental relationship comes our motivation for unity, for love, like we looked at last week, and for life within the body and life out in the world. Hold firmly to this fundamental relationship, to that first word, to that initial hope that is the living word, Jesus Christ. Hold firmly. Hold firmly like I was about to do on that rooftop of the Space Needle. Hold firmly like a young child holding onto a tow rope who's skiing for the first time. Hold firmly to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and share the story of how by grace you are still a work in progress. It's this message that we need to bring. Bring to friends, bring to neighbors, bring to coworkers, bring to anyone we meet. Why? Because it's our only sure hope in a world plagued by so much hopelessness. Share the hope that Christ is alive and one day he will return to set all things right, even the messes that we've made with our neighbors, creation, and ourselves. So let's go. Let's go and hold firmly, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. And let's make that our prayer. Dear Father, God of the living, thank you that Christ's revelation of himself by the power of the living spirit of truth is within our souls and that he is Lord of our lives and testifies that he is not dead but alive forevermore. Thank you that he lives and reigns in all our hearts. Thank you that by your grace we are what we are a work in progress being saved by you. We rejoice that the resurrection is preached and in the power of the Holy Spirit we hold firmly to this. We thank you, Father, for making all this possible within creation. Thank you that we don't have to believe that death ends it all, either for Jesus or for us. In the name of Jesus, we come thanking you for your resurrection power and asking that we may live so as to always have the hope the living hope of sharing it in it, and the living hope of giving a reason that we hope to our neighbors. Let us always hold firmly to you and share your living hope and grace. In your name we pray. Amen. And at this time we'll hear some uh, instrumental reflective music and take a few moments to pray about what we're holding on firmly to. And as that's ongoing, just want to thank everyone for your continued support of the ministry here at Resurrection, and for those watching online, there's a few ways to give if you want to, um, but otherwise, let's just be in prayer and give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and we can hold firmly to him. Amen.
we can face tomorrow and hold firmly to that hope. Amen, indeed. And so at this time, we'll uh, take time to be in prayer before our living Lord. Um, and so for those here, you can go in whatever posture prayer is best for you, whether that's rising and standing for prayer, or you can stay sitting or uh, kneel if you even want to. And, and for those of you at home, you can uh, enter in any prayer requests you have, and we'll make sure to pray over them during the week. And so with that said, let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. And we praise you, Lord, that we can hold firmly to you. We rejoice that in all seasons and craziness of life, we can hold firmly to you and that you will not let go. May we go forth to live out our faith and grace, sharing the matters of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, but that also he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that his followers witnessed it and proclaimed it. May we now go to share this witness and proclaim it out in our lives. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. And we give thanks that Jesus is a Lord and God who calls uh, and teaches with patience. With this in mind, we give thanks for all teachers and their vocations. We pray that they would inspire their students to learn and grow and become amazing humans. For teachers who are Christians, we pray their light would shine out into their students' lives and impact them for your love forever. And finally, we pray that you would keep all teachers and their students safe and healthy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And if we think about the gospel lesson that Frank read and we think about Jesus calling the disciples to be fishers of men, we give thanks for those in our region who have the calling to work in the seafood industry. Bless them with wisdom to use the resources of the sea wisely. And we also ask that you would keep them safe. And most of all, in such a hard industry, we pray that they would know your grace and your peace and your hope, that they would all know your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And O oh, Creator, beyond the seas, we give thanks for all the wondrous creation you have made. The heavens and earth are filled with your glory. Reveal your splendor in fiery sunsets and in the deep blue twilights. Teach us to recognize your beauty in the natural world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we look around uh, at our neighbors in this beautiful world we have, you have made, we lift up to you those who do not feel loved or held in loving arms. May we be people who would hold these people firmly in the love of Jesus. Give us courage and purpose to be fishers of all people, sharing your kingdom with all who are burdened by guilt or the pain of the past or whatever is on their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as we think about hurting hearts and those who need support and uplifting, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would soften the hearts of rulers and governments, that they would perceive you and hold firmly to you. In doing so, may they govern wisely and care to the needs of their people. Where there are struggles or divides, we pray you would change the hearts of both the leaders and the people to remove any corruption or impulse toward violence there might be. And finally, we ask you would protect first responders and military personnel who risk their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In spirit of healing and hope, we remember before you the many communities and individuals experiencing ongoing conflict and violence, natural disasters, and those yearning for education and struggling for freedom. We join our prayers with those who are desperate people everywhere, trusting in your gifts of courage and resilience to grapple with these steep challenges. In a world of so much abundance, inspire generosity and hope among those who give and those who receive. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. And we give thanks that your steadfast love endures forever. So we pray that you do not abandon those who look to you for hope and healing. Draw near to those who are scared, sick, and in pain. 
We especially lift up to our dear brother in Christ, Frank Pito, as he is going in to have a pacemaker inserted on Wednesday. We pray, Lord, that the surgery would go successfully and that he would have full healing and restoration. We continue to pray for our dear sister, Joan Thomas, for continued healing, care, and recovery for her ongoing health issues. And Lord, we also lift up to you uh, Doug Patelko as he's uh, commuting back and forth from Utah up here to Seattle every week for cancer treatment. Continue to give him ongoing strength, uh, sustenance in your care and love. And Lord, we also lift up to you his mom, June Patelko, and uh, her ongoing cancer struggles, but also give thanks that her tumor has shrunk by half. And we just continue to pray that it would continue to shrink and you'd bring full healing to her. And Lord, we pray for all those on our hearts that you would bring them full healing and restoration. We also pray and ask you would bless all doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists, and all caregivers with wisdom, compassion, and good health. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And at this time, lift up any of the prayers or praises on your hearts. Hear our prayer. Dear Lord, pray for healing for Barb and her emotions and her physical state. Give her your courage and enthusiasm and encouragement. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up to you all these prayers, spoken, all those unspoken, knowing that your Holy Spirit lifts up prayers for us even when we don't have the words. And all those lifted up here and in our homes, knowing that your ability to hear our prayers knows no bounds. And we're thankful for that and bold to pray then as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And as we now enter into our time of communion, we'll sing out as we sort of approach the table, so to speak. So I invite you all to rise and stand as we sing out, O Jesus, blessed Lord, to thee. You'll know the tune is that is the doxology, and we'll sing that then as the third verse of the hymn. So let us sing out.
praise the Lord, and we are welcomed now to the table of him. So you can take down your mass as we receive the Lord's Supper. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. So take and eat the body of Christ, which is given for you. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink for all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So take and drink the blood of Christ, which is shed for you. And as you're done, you may put your mask back up to receive the communion blessing and benediction of our Lord. And now, having received the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, go strengthen this day to life everlasting, the one true faith, departing in his peace and joy. And as you go forth, hold firmly that Christ has died, that he has risen, and that he lives and reigns forever, one God. Go and share how you are work in progress, saved by grace. Amen. Amen. And as you do, hold formally to the word and live it out. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. And let us now sing out, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.